We have been given the scientific knowledge, the technical ability, and the materials to pursue the exploration of the universe. Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. This is the Saturn V, mankind's greatest achievement. This is the rocket that took men to the moon. On July 16, 1969, America planted its flag on a land 250,000 miles away on behalf of 7 billion humans. It took the mind of 400,000 engineers, $240 billion, and the greatest rocket ever built. It truly was one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But how did the Saturn V actually launch? And can we do it again? Let's start with the engines of the Saturn V. The engines are F1 engines which provide almost a million pounds of thrust every single second. How do those engines actually work? Let's go ahead and check out our model rocket engines right here. So what do we have here? We have two chambers on the top. We have number one, the fuel, which is the liquid methane, CH4. We have the oxidizer, which is liquid oxygen. And both of these are gonna travel to the combustion chamber. In the combustion chamber, there's gonna be an igniter. The igniter is gonna light a spark that's gonna make these two, the fuel and the oxidizer, explode. After they explode, the pressure and temperature is gonna decrease in that chamber and the kinetic energy is going to increase so that the total energy remains the same. So after the kinetic energy increases right here, the rocket's propellant is going to go down and the rocket is going to go up, Newton's third law, and so the rocket is going to propel itself right uh, upwards. Okay, so that's great. This, uh, these three components are critical to the rocket engine. And now let's check out what happens when you have three different variations on these engines. Number one, we're talking about these components. You just saw the combustion chamber, which is at the bottom of the rocket, but even below that is the throat. That's where the, the transition between the low pressure, the high pressure, and the low pressure happens. And below the throat, we have the exit chamber. This is where you have low kinetic energy. Here's where you have high kinetic energy. And the reason why is because your throat is converging above the combustion chamber and diverging below the exit chamber. Okay. So what's happening here? Well, as I said, we have these three quantities, pressure and temperature are high in the combustion chamber, but low in the exit chamber. And velocity is low in the combustion chamber, but high in the exit chamber. So when you have this kind of a nozzle where you're converging at the top, but diverging in the bottom, this is called a de Laval nozzle. And it's optimal when all of your thrust is happening directly below the rocket. That happens when the pressure exhaust is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere. But if your exhaust pressure is greater than your atmospheric pressure, what's going to happen is you're going to start to see diamonds. You're going to see diamonds when the engine starts up and you're going to see the engine actually expand. You're going to see the, the exhaust gas expand outside of the nozzle. And that's inefficient because it doesn't it doesn't propel the rocket upwards as much as it should. And the worst case scenario is when you're exhaust pressure is less than your atmospheric pressure, that's when your rocket is unstable. Your nozzle is inefficient because you can create flow separation at these points and that can damage the nozzle. Now let's check out how the rocket actually works at the blackboard. Rockets function on the conservation of momentum, okay? And how does that work? Well, if you've got a rocket that's propelling itself like this, 
what's the rocket going to do? Well, it's going to eject a lot of particles of gas out its back. And as the gases move backward, the rocket is going to propel itself forward. In fact, we have an equation just to describe that. The force of the particles on the rocket is equal to minus the force of the rocket on the particles. And so the rocket will go right, the particles will go left. In fact, there's an equation that describes how much payload we can carry in the cone of the rocket. And here is that equation. The ratio of the rocket's final velocity to its exhaust velocity is equal to ln of the rocket's final mass to its initial mass. And this right here, this is called the rocket equation because it is critical to describing how much mass you can carry on the rocket that is not fuel. In fact, it is because of this equation that over 90% of the rocket must be fuel, must be oxidized or whatnot. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how the Saturn V launched. Thanks for watching. We'll check you out next time and sponsored by Brilliant.org. Ambition plus MKO plus scaffolding equal learning. We believe anyone can learn anything. That's why our motto is memorization is a crime. And that's why we partnered with Brilliant. Brilliant transforms math and science into hands-on activities so that you too can understand everything from first grade math to E equals MC squared. Barry Science Lab and Brilliant is your MKO and will give you the scaffolding to expand your ZPD until you become the next Sir Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein. Visit brilliant.org slash Barry Science Lab today. And the first 50 of you to use that link will get a 20% discount on the Brilliant annual subscription. Don't, Don't forget, forget that, that you too can, can become, become the next Einstein. Einstein. So, so let's, let's fall in love, love with math and science. science.